You will, uh, you will note by his attire that Chairman of the Commission, for Commission Rick Campo was unaware when he accepted the post that he was required to work Tuesday and Thursdays on the docks at the uh, Bayport Terminal. I think he's held up very well. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Rick's job is CEO of Camden Property Trust, uh, which is uh, an enormous nationwide uh, company uh, dealing in multifamily uh, units primarily. Uh, Rick was uh, elected miraculously, uh, and I say miraculously, in uh, January of 2019 because the Houston City Council and the Houston uh, Harris County Commissioner's Court had to actually agree on something. And uh, enough of them agreed to make Rick the uh, chairman of the commission. We're very, very glad that, uh, that, he, that they did, Rick. Uh, Rick's done an exemplary job. He was uh, re-nominated and re-elected by uh, uh, Commissioner's Court and the Houston City Council in 2021. Yeah, and uh, we are very glad to have him and he's going to give our keynote address. Please help me welcome Chairman of the Port of Houston Commission, Rick Campo. Let me get organized here. Y'all hear me in the back? Everybody can hear me okay? Okay, great. So wave if you can, all right? You can hear me, good. All right, so um, yeah, so uh, I was, uh, this is my second appearance at, at this event. I think I did one virtually last year, so maybe it's the third. But I really love coming here because it's uh, just a, a great opportunity to talk about how awesome uh, our region is and how amazing the port is and, and how the value creation across the port uh, is, is uh, manifested by the people in this room, everything you do every single day. It's really important. And when you think about, when I think about the port in Port Houston, I think about two things. First, I think Port Houston being the port authority and what the port authority does, and then the port as being the community of the port, right? So there's over 200 terminals at, at, uh, up and down the ship channel, and Port Houston only manages eight. But uh, I'm going to talk about what we do and how we do it specifically, and then, and then sort of broaden it out and, and talk about what's going on in the, in the port business overall. Uh, but just to start with, uh, the, the question is, so why does the Port Authority exist in the first place, right? And if you go way back into the history, uh, there were lots of different agencies that, that were in and around the port in the early 1900s, and our, our uh, political leaders at the time decided to consolidate all those entities and bring them under one port authority, and that's why Harris County is involved in Pasadena, the council of mayors, and uh, appointing the commissioners, and I'll talk about that here in a second. But, but really what the port is about, it's about economic growth. It's about opportunity, quality of life, creating jobs, period, end of story when you think about it, right? Every company in here is all about their employees, ultimately, and the employees are the ones who actually do the work and create all the value for all of us. That's why I wear this Port Authority uh, shirt that's worn by our people uh, uh, that work day to day uh, uh, on the docks uh, as, a, as a outward measure of respect and pride for those folks that, that make it all happen. Because at the end of the day, the, the executives and the management are all about creating value and opportunity for their employees. And if we don't focus on our employees first, then you can't ever take care of customers. So when I think about, about what we're trying to do at the port, it's about making sure our team members have a safe environment, have upside, have the ability to create value for their families. Because uh, ultimately, that, though, that's the bottom line, I think, any business should think about to start with is how are, how are employees taken care of and then ultimately they take care of customers and then ultimately the shareholders or stakeholders do well if there are smiles on the faces of the employees and the customers, right? So the Port Authority is about creating that economic value uh, through what we do every day. Uh, when you think about what we do every day, we, we, we take care of those eight uh, public docks. Anybody can come to them. You just have to, you know, roll up, get the pilot, bring you in, and you can come to a, come to a, a public dock and, and unload or offload or load uh, your products. Uh, and that, that's a big business for sure, uh, and it's a really good business. I'll talk about that here in a second. The second thing the port does is we're the non-federal sponsor or steward if you, of the channel, if you want to call that, non-federal sponsor. 
And that's important because the channel is a federal waterway. It's controlled by the federal government. The Coast Guard uh, it runs it from a, from a you know, sort of rules and regulations perspective. And the Corps of, Engineer run, uh, Corps of Engineers run it from a build and, and management perspective, dredging, things like that. So it's not, the port doesn't manage it. Port Houston doesn't have anything to do with whether the port gets opened or closed. We do support in a very big way. We have a fire department, we have a police department, and we support the, the leaders that run the port actually, being the Coast Guard and the, the Corps, of Eng Corps of Engineers. The non-federal sponsor part of the equation is about partnering with the federal government to make sure the channel gets deepened and widened when it needs to, that the maintenance is going on with it properly, and things like that. So that's, that, that's really what the Port Authority does when you think about it, is just the eight docks and the non-federal sponsor. The other 200 plus uh, terminals and docks uh, around the, uh, uh, the ship channel are privately held, or public companies or private individuals and private businesses. And at the end of the day, we're here to support the channel and the partnership with the federal government. And so I think it's really important to, to, to understand that, that sort of really specific relationship that Port Houston has relative to the federal uh, folks as well. Because it's a partnership, obviously. Uh, all of us are in this together. We all use a channel. We all have to make sure that, that, that the channel is, is, uh, is you know, in good shape and we can get you know, products in and out of, the, out of the channel. So it is a serious partnership, obviously. Uh, the Port Commission, uh, Commissioner Don Carlos, thank you for that in introduction. I see Commissioner Meese here as well. The Port Commission is, a, is an interesting group because it's a regional commission when you think about it. So there are two uh, commissioners appointed by the city, two by the county, and then one by the city of Pasadena, that's Commissioner Meese here, and then one by the council of mayors, which, is, which uh, Commissioner Don Carlos is that appointee. So it's a regional group. Now the chairman is appointed uh, by a combination of the city and the county, and as, as Commissioner Don Carlos uh, sort of uh, pointed out, and it, you ch generally have a hard time getting those folks to agree to anything, and let alone uh, uh, who, who's going to be the chairman. Unfortunately, um, we, uh, I, I did get elected in, uh, in this year, in 2021, unanimously, which is really weird, right? Uh, it wasn't so much the case in 2019. We might have had a little, little energy, uh, you know, one-way traffic kind of, hoo-ha that was going, brouhaha that was going on during that period of time. I can tell you today, that's over. We are great partners with energy. The energy uh, groups went to Washington with us and helped us get the deepening and widening uh, project approved. Uh, and we're in really good shape from that perspective. All these members of the commission, uh, they, they uh, have one vote. No one has a, a bigger vote than the other. And we try to build consensus about how the Port Authority ought to go forward and what kind of things we should invest our capital in going forward. So it's really a fun group to work with, a lot of really good experience in the maritime business. For me, I, when I came uh, to the Port Authority, I really didn't know anything about ports, um, and I learned really fast. I'm a fast learner, which uh, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed being involved in this, in this um, in the, in the, just the overall process of, of what's been going on over the last couple of years. Uh, when you think about uh, these jobs we talked about, I saw that on the video you, show, you saw the Pasadena discussion. Well, when you think about the port uh, of Houston, it's 1.35 million jobs locally, 3.2 million nationally, uh, three, over 300 billion of Texas economic impact. And just to put that in perspective, that's over 20% of Texas GDP gen is generated from the, the activity at the Port of Houston, the community of the Port of Houston, not Port Authority, but the community of the port, right? And 800 billion when you think about it nationally. It's just a massive economic engine that we all have to support and we all have to continue to invest in it and to make sure that, that, that this economic engine doesn't sputter and stall because if it does, we're talking jobs. And when, when you think about the quality of life of Houstonians that we're all trying to improve, it starts with a job. And if you can't pay your rent or you know, do the things that we need to do uh, and take care of our families without a job. And so our, our, our job is to make sure that we continue to invest in and continue to support this amazing economic engine that has been built over the last 100 plus years uh, for our region. When you think about uh, I don't, th this slide's interesting because you know, I don't, I'm preaching to the choir here, right, and talking about the energy capital of the world. But I think it's interesting, there's a lot of people that don't understand 
the interconnections of energy and, and how the energy business really works. They think that, that if Chevron uh, or Shell or Exxon uh, discovers oil somewhere and then they own it all the way through the process and do something to it at the end and then you, you, know, you put gas in your car, right? But the, the fact that we have pipelines coming to Houston, the fact that we have over 500 million barrels of storage capacity uh, and refining capacity and all the different molecule changes that we do in the, in the supply chain of a barrel of oil, that, that's a value add proposition for our region. And what that really means when you get down to it is we're an international global uh, marketplace for energy. Uh, when, I, when I talk to non-energy folks, they, they go, well, wait a minute, what does that mean? And it means really that, what I try to tell them is it means that when a barrel, when a barrel of oil comes out of the well, it starts getting sold. <laughs> when it is in the pipeline, when it goes to the refinery, when it goes in the ship, and, and, and that, that, that marketplace is what makes the world goes, go round. And, and we're a marketplace for energy, and that's, that's I think, as important as the idea that we have it here and refine it. The, uh, I think when uh, you, you uh, heard earlier uh, about uh, what's going on in the petrochemical business uh, and, and talked a little bit about energy transition, and that's something that we all have to think about. Because ultimately, in the next 20 years, there's going to be a transition, and we have to be at the forefront of that. We cannot be the Detroit of energy in the future. We have to be focused on new technologies, we have to focus on, on carbon capture, decarbonization, and we need to be the ones leading that, not being drugged behind by shareholders and, and, fo and folks like that. And so the Port Houston is definitely leading in that area. We talk about environmental um, action today uh, a little bit later. Uh, the, the, uh, when you think about what's going on at the port, 74% of all shipping in and out of the Port Houston is liquid. So we have to focus on and be a part of and be leading in this energy transition area. And if we don't, then we will be Detroit. And that, that is an ugly, ugly, uh, um, you know, analogy. When you think about the environment, you know, obviously energy transition is about the environment ultimately. Uh, but at Port Houston, we're a steward of the environment. We're, it's really critical to us to invest in projects uh, in, environmentally. Uh, we, we've done a number of things. We're the first port to go 100% renewable, renewable electricity given that we use a lot of electricity for our cranes and what have you, we're buying electric vehicles and electric RTGs and, uh, and, and trying to make sure that we are part of the solution and not part of the problem. And we are having to invest in those uh, types of, of things. Uh, in uh, June and July of this year, we held a sustainability action uh, meetings where we brought in all sort of comers that wouldn't want to come and talk to us, including, including environmental groups like the Environmental Defense Fund, Air, air, air Quality folks, uh, along with energy and with other shipping companies to talk about, okay, let's, let's really figure this out. Let's make a list of projects and, and not just talk about being environmental stewards. Let's list projects, find out what, what's really actionable today, where can we put our money that gives us the best bang for our buck in the current environment, and, and we have those meetings and they're really w uh, well done and, and we're, we're gonna be rolling out more information about that via the port here in the next, um, in our budget cycle coming up in October and November. So it's really important, I think, for us to really focus on these issues. And if we don't, if we just hide behind, oh, there's no cl climate change and there's no bio environmental issues or anything like that, we're gonna be Detroit. Because it's, it's common and there's nothing we can do about it other than work on it. One of the things that, that we're really proud of at Port Houston is our, uh, the formation of our business equity, uh, business equity division. Business equity is really about making sure that the jobs that we are creating get to the broader community. We've had an amazing uh, small business program that the port has put forth um, over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, we have issued contracts to, uh, to, to small businesses uh, over $600 million in the program. Uh, and now we're expanding that to an MWB uh, program as well. Now, a lot of times when people hear MWB, what they hear is uh, set-asides, higher costs, oh my God, that's a bad thing. Well, having been involved in over $3 billion of MWB projects, and I'll use one as an example, the Marriott Marquis Hotel in downtown Houston was done by Houston First. I was the chair of Houston First at the time, and we had a 30% MWB uh, component requirement because there was about 100 and 
60 million dollars of city money that went into that hotel. And Ira Minsner, who's the developer of that hotel, who is a pretty tough businessman and a very good developer and construction guy, he would tell you today that, he, that his MWB uh, components were better than and better than or equal to his non-MWBE people, and he didn't pay one dollar more for the hotel as a result of that program. So we need to make sure that we, we, we expand the program by making sure that people understand how to deal with the port. How do you win a contract if you're a minority or a small business, right? How do you do that? And sometimes you need to break contracts into smaller pieces. Sometimes you need to have them partner with other folks and, and that kind of thing. So we need to, to, to build the capacity of our community so that our diverse uh, economy and our, our diverse community can actually do really well. Because uh, when you think about it, Houston is the most diverse city or region in America. It really is. The, the U.S. will look like Houston 20 years from now. And so we're already there, right? And so it's really important for us to lift up our folks and to make sure that we're providing education programs and helping people figure out how to, how to start a business and, and how to deal with the port and deal with others um, like that. And I think that, that's part of the program here. It's, it's, it's about making sure that we lift up the community. And so we're really excited about that. Now we have a 30% um, goal. It's not gonna happen overnight. I can tell you that because it's new to, to the port and it's also new to the community. So we're gonna, it, we'll, we'll hopefully ramp that up over, um, over the next year or two and get to those numbers uh, at some point. But I think it's, one, it's critical that we, as a community, uh, think in, the, in this way. Let's talk a little bit about where we are container updates. So the, so the two big um, revenue uh, generators for the port are Bayport and Barbara's Cut. And when you think about uh, what's going on in America today with, with uh, supply chain, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, most products, 80% of consumer goods and food come in containers. And so when you think about containers, 2020, uh, we exceeded 3 million TEUs. Uh, we, we, in 2020, we were named by the Corps of Engineers as the number one port in America, not just foreign tonnage, but number one total compared to all the rest of the ports in America. And, and you know this, that we have more ships that come in and out of our port than at Long Beach, LA, New York, and New Jersey combined. And, and that has to do with the, with the energy part of our business, right? And so it's such a big, big part of our equation, uh, the, having to be able to grow our TEUs and grow, the, grow that business. Uh, we're sixth in the nation in terms of TEUs. I, I like this slide too, because it kind of shows what's coming and what's going. And when you look at what's coming in, it's all consumer, project, consumer uh, products, food, machinery, you know, things like that. Uh, but, but things that people need every day. And we all know that, that we're having trouble getting things every day. Uh, and that's, that's a challenge. And, and th this, is, this is where it comes from, though. And then the, the flip side of it is, the, is what we send out. Obviously, resins and plastics are the biggest part. When you look at, at that number, all, you know, 520,000 TEUs there. Uh, but a lot of other products. What are the one the fun ones that I like to talk about is some automotive. You think, oh, what automotive stuff do we sell? There's no plants here in Houston, right? We don't build cars. Well, they build Teslas in California and ship them over here, and we ship them out to Europe. So we we actually are. You know, when you think about it, when people when I was up in Congress talking about why the channel is so important, I would say, well, we we ship Teslas. I mean, isn't that important? We're helping the world with with energy, you know, uh, cars. And they were like. What? That's not right. You can't ship Teslas. What are you talking about? We do. And part of the reason is, is because of the complication of exporting things out of LA and Long Beach, they chose Houston. And there's going to be a lot more of that competition where we pull competition from the East Coast and the West Coast because we're such a great port and we have good ingress, egress, and our cost structure makes sense. In 2021, our, our TUs are up 16%, which is huge. When you think about it, and the other thing that's interesting about about the the, um, the TEUs, and for you, those of you who don't know that that lingo, it's uh, 20 foot equivalent units. It's basically the box they're talking about, right? The TEU, and so um, the TEUs coming in. We're, we used to be prior to the pandemic. We used to be one to one. We'd bring one one in and send one out. Now it's three to one in, one out which means that, and, and what's happened is there's more consumer goods coming in here because of our population growth, and then the, just compu uh, consumer behavior overall. And that's, that's the real interesting thing when you think about con consumer behavior and what's happened sort of during the pandemic and after the pandemic. 
and they're coming from, uh, we have a pretty good balance of where these TEUs come from. You know, East Asia, 30, you know, roughly a third, and then Europe, Latin America, Indian subcontinent. And we're starting to get more, uh, we've got, we've received two new services from Asia. And when you think about 60 plus ships sitting outside of Long Beach, LA right now, waiting to go in, uh, and we, it's, if you're gonna sit out there, you might as well go through the Pine Panama Canal and come to Houston, right? When you think about the supply chain, now that's, that's a, a, a really interesting discussion here. Our, you can just say this globally, that the supply chain is out of whack. And it's out of whack every point in the chain. Uh, if you think about the beginning of the chain, right, which is products being made, and a lot of products that we, that we use in, in the US are made in Asia. And when you think about what's happening in China, China doesn't tolerate the coronavirus. So a few weeks ago, maybe a month and a half ago, they shut down their third largest port because one person at the port had coronavirus. And they, they just shut it down for four weeks. And, they, and China's, they don't care about what happens to the supply chain. It's just boom, they shut it down. And, uh, and, that, and that's what they do. So that starts issues, right? You have products that aren't, aren't that are you know, stacking up in China, and then ships that can't get them, and then it screws up the scheduling uh, of ships. So now you have a situation where the where the the end of the or the beginning of the supply chains get messed up. That messes the ships up. So now you have ships that 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 are are not totally full, maybe, or or are off their schedules and what have you. Uh, once that starts happening, then you start getting complications of, of queuing uh, where they are in the ports. Uh, then when you think about the consumer uh, and how the consumer is reacted, that three to one TEU ratio that I talked about a minute ago, that's because consumers are buying more. Instead of going on vacation and, and uh, having, uh, going to restaurants and things like that during the pandemic, they went online and they started buying stuff, right? And they're continuing to buy stuff. Consumer spending is up big time. When you think about cons the consumer it's itself, consumers are very flush with cash. You know, the personal income has gone up $133 trillion since the beginning of the pandemic to today. And most people, if you, and when you think about jobs, we, we, even though Houston hasn't added back most of its jobs since the pandemic, Houston, interestingly enough, compared to Dallas and Austin, Dallas and Austin are exceeding their, their, their number of jobs they had pre-pandemic. Houston, we're only 65% to that, to that, maybe 68 today. And part of that's energy because we're energy dependent, obviously, and the energy companies today, even though we've added 19,000 jobs in energy in 2021, we lost a whole lot more of those jobs in 2019 and 2020. And if you remember, energy wasn't doing that great in 2020 or 2019. Uh, we, we had uh, oil prices go from $75 a barrel in, uh, in October of, of, um, of 18 and was 45 bucks in beginning of 19. So Houston hasn't come back as, as much as the rest of the country, even though we're doing well in everything we do. So when you think about the, the consumers and, and consumer activities, even though Houston's jobs aren't back, our consumers are pretty flush with cash. Uh, when you think about all the government payments that have been made and, and the you know, unemployment insurance and things like that, even with people, people without jobs ha have money and they're buying stuff. And then when you think about how they're buying, they're buying online rather than just going into Walmart or Costco or wherever they used to. So what's happening then is, is the warehouse space is full. And so a, a truck, a, a box comes into Port Houston, gets put on a truck, it goes to the warehouse. And then what happens is it sits on a chassis in the warehouse because they don't have enough room in the warehouse to unload the box. And the reason they don't have enough room in the warehouse is that they don't now, they used to take 52 foot trucks and, and fill them up with stuff, take them to Walmart or Costco or wherever. And now they're taking smaller trucks and trying to do just-in-time delivery to, uh, to consumers at their homes instead of these, these uh, retail outlets. So you have a, a fundamental change in A, the, the, the consumer spending, and then B, in how the products are, are, are delivered to the consumer. And that has created this backlog between the, the, the full the full uh, warehouses, the chassis sitting there with a box on them, and you can't take a, um, a, a TEU off a chassis because they don't have RTGs, rubber tire, uh, rubber tire gantry uh, cranes there, and, they, and so they sit. So now you have a shortage of chassis. Now all the chassis are made, by the way, in China or in Asia. Can't buy any chassis today, you can't get them over here. 
And so what's happening is you just have this massive supply chain, and then we have a shortage of truckers. We have, so you, you get the picture. It's, a, it's tough. And then the problem with that, obviously, is that prices are up dramatically. If you think about a cost of shipping something from Europe or from Asia, it's up five to 10 times uh, the, the cost, and, and it's just a, a total mess. Now, from my, my perspective, when I'm at Camden, I have, I have two buildings that we built, two high-rise buildings in Atlanta, finished, ready to go, but no appliances. We, you can't lease an apartment without a fridge, okay? And so my guys had to go. We went to every Home Depot in Georgia with pickup trucks to buy refrigerators, all different kinds, different shapes. Now, the challenge, though, is we built our property to a spec that said it's this size, and it goes in here, and it fits perfectly, right? Well, when you go to you know, Home Depot and you hope to get the right, uh, the right size, they're not all the right size. So you got some with some we had to knock, the, knock some of the wall out, and others you had to you know, look stupid because they have a big gap. And that's what's going on with the supply chain. And by the way, we didn't ask what the price was. We just asked, can we get it? And that's the problem we have today with the supply chain. It is just a, and, and by the way, it's not going to get fixed in 2022. It's not a, a one month, two month, three month kind of problem because it's such a complicated piece of equation. Right now we have six ships sitting in the Gulf waiting to be unloaded. And that's unheard of for us. The only time we ever have, have ships that back up are when we, uh, at Port Houston, or when we have a weather event. You have fog or you have a, you know, a, a, the channel shut down for whatever reason. Then, then you have a situation where you have, you know, people stacking up in the Gulf. Uh, today, we're, they're stacked up because we don't have the capacity to move them out. And, and we, we're, we're at double, I think, our, our uh, number of boxes that are sitting at our, at our terminal uh, today that haven't been picked up. The good news is, is that a lot of people in that supply chain are doing really well financially, right? Because they're, they're, they're making a lot of money. The problem with that, however, is consumers are gonna have to pay more, and that's the question of whether inflation is transitory or not. It's gonna be here for quite a while just because of those supply chain issues and because everyone is, is moving that cost onto a consumer ultimately when you, when you think about that. So it, it is definitely a, a major issue. Now for us, uh, the other thing I think is really interesting is a benefit, the, the, the whole congestion on the East Coast and the West Coast is benefiting Houston because we don't have as much congestion. And the other piece of the equation is most of the, co the, the uh, ports on the other coasts don't have expansion cap capability. You really can't expand Long Beach and, and LA very much. And it's in those markets, it's very hard. I don't know if you saw the, the, um, the, uh, the uh, LA game where they christened their brand new stadium. It will cost $5 billion to build that stadium in California. And our stadium, which I was involved in building here of NRG, would cost probably five or six hundred million. That's how different the world is just because of regulatory construct and things like that. Also, in California has a labor contract coming up in 2022. We have labor peace in Houston. We have great support from our ILA and our other labors. We have labor unions. We have not had a labor issue since 19, in the mid-1980s. And, and part of that is, two, we have two, uh, two uh, labor folks on the Port Authority Board, or uh, Commission, and we just know how to do business here versus some of these other ports. We have the ability to expand. We're, gonna, we're expanding uh, our, our Wharf 6 now. We bought new ship-to-shore cranes, so we have room to expand and to get bigger. And then when you think about the expansion, Project 11 is the key because ultimately we need to make sure that, that, that we have a safe channel and an efficient channel, and we can have two-way traffic in our channel all the time, and Project 11 guarantees that. So this one we already sort of talked about, but let, let's talk about um, uh, the, the other part of the equation is not just containers, it's all the other brake bulk. And we've seen an increase in brake bulk and all brake bulk uh, types of shipments, which is really good for Houston because not just steel for, for, uh, for um, uh, drilling, which has gone up. Uh, you know, our, our rig count, I think, is 550 or something like that, uh, up from the low of two, some 250, plus or minus. But what's really exciting is more um, manufacturing activity is happening in Houston, which means our economy is getting better, not just because of oil and gas, which is great. Uh, and we're start, starting to see, see some really good things from that, which is, which is really good. Uh, when, you, when you think about uh, the channel, not, this is something that we talk about a lot in the, 
at, at the port, and, and it's a really th easy thing to remember, which is no channel, no port, no port, no cargo, no cargo, no commerce, no commerce, no jobs. And, and we, I started with jobs, I'm gonna finish with jobs, because it really is all about jobs and keeping people working and helping them make ends meet. Uh, and the most important piece of the equation for us right now is Project 11. It's expanding the channel. Now in a normal process, uh, and this is a federal waterway, right? So we don't control how that process works. And usually it's 15 year minimum to go start to think about expanding a channel to getting it finished. And that's not because Port Houston doesn't want to move fast, it's because the, the federal government has a process and we have to go through that process. So we are now seven years into the process. We started in 2014, it's now 2011, right? So, or 2021. And so we're seven years in the process. Uh, we are gonna begin construction uh, likely by the end of this year uh, on Project 11, which is like light speed for federal projects, by the way. Uh, and we're going to, the most important part of the project, at least to start with, is going to be the expansion from 530 feet to 700 feet on the Bay Reach part of that channel. And that, that's where the congestion happens. That's where the, the, the one-way, two-way traffic issues be, are. That's also where the most, uh, th that's where the, uh, it, when we have an accident or a, a ship uh, event where, where a ship hits another ship, it happens there. And this will improve the, the, the flow through in the channel. It'll also improve the safety of the channel to make sure we don't have, the, have those events. It'll allow uh, larger ships to come in, which well, when you get down to uh, larger ships, it just, it's just economics. The more you can put on a ship, no matter whether it's oil or you know, petrochemical products or containers, the more profitable that is. And, the, and, and w when you get down to it, cargo, and whether it's liquid cargo or container cargo or break -break cargo, cargo flows like water. It tries to find the, the, the cheapest and easiest way to get to, to, uh, to the consumer. And so we need to make sure that it's easy to get through our channel, it's safe to get through our channel, or we can't expand our business. And we need to expand our businesses, all of us do, uh, to, to go forward. Our um, project is a uh, billion dollars. Uh, you know, billion used to, I guess when they're talking in Congress about trillions of dollars for infrastructure programs and stuff like that, billion seems pretty cheap to me. <laughs> Even though a billion, a billion, it just rolls off your tongue, right? A billion, that's okay. But uh, it's a billion dollars, it's a pr public-private partnership. Um, and, and as I said earlier, uh, we went hand in hand, the port did hand in hand with our, our energy partners uh, to um, Washington DC and we had you know, all the major players, Enterprise and Kinder Morgan and Chevron, and you know, they, they all went with us and helped us get uh, this last bullet here, which is WERDA. WERDA is the Water Resource Development Act, and any project in America, it's, it happens every two years, and uh, any project as Corps of Engineers has to go to WERDA, and it basically goes through the, the House and, and the Senate and, then, and gets passed by Congress, and then ultimately has to be signed by the President. Uh, what, that happened in December of 2020. And then the next step in the process is, is, uh, is a new start. And what that means is that the, the government has to uh, put it on the Corps of Engineers schedule and say, we're starting and here's money to the Corps to be able to have to appropriate money to the Corps to, to, uh, uh, to spend time on the project. That usually takes eight months to a year. And uh, because of the very unique and unusual environment, and I think the, also the need to expand the channel, it happened in a month. It happened in January of 2021, 20, uh, and Houston was awarded a new start. The Corps was awarded the money to work on it, uh, and that gave us the ability to then start the process. Now, the interesting thing is that, is that even though we weren't approved in, until 2020, and we didn't get the new start until 2021, we decided as a commission to spend money in advance of that, to assume that it would happen, go out on a limb and spend 35 to $40 million designing the project with the Corps of Engineers so we would have shovel-ready plans if this happened and we got ready to do it. So the only reason we can start construction this year is because of that investment that was made and sort of rolling the dice, if you will, uh, that, that it, would, it would happen, but that's what we do here. That's what the commission does, that's what people in Houston do. 
we are can do, we're gonna get it done, and we're gonna make sure it gets done in the, in the most timely uh, fashion. And we did that at Port Houston, and that's why we'll start construction uh, this year. Uh, we'll, I think next Port Commission meeting in October, uh, we'll have, um, we'll award the contracts on, on phase 1A, which is the first half with, from Bolivar Roads to, I think, Redfish, is that right? Right. And, and then right after that, we'll do the, we'll f go right into the to, uh, two, which will take it up to, to uh, towards Morgan's Point. But the bottom line in all this, it's about making sure that, that we're doing all the right things to keep the economic engine going, to keep the jobs going, to keep, to make sure that all of the users of the port are out there in a safe and efficient channel to, to do what they do so they can pay their employees and, and add more jobs. So um, when, when I think about, that's all I think about in terms of what we do. It's about creating those jobs and we do it the way using, using, using port funds. Uh, when you think about expansion, we are using uh, internally gener generated port funds for a lot of th this work. Uh, the Corps of Engineers, the way the, the, the non-federal sponsor works generally is uh, the, the Corps pays 65% of the project and, and we pay 35% of the project. Now, Energy is, has, has uh, uh, told us they're gonna pay half and, uh, and in order to expedite it, you know, we, we were gonna try to use as little of of core money as we can, primarily because it takes forever to get it. The core has only been, been uh, authorized to spend roughly $20 million so far on a billion dollar project. So Port Houston has spent all the rest. And what's gonna happen on, on 1A is that we're gonna, f we're gonna pay the core's portion of 1A, the port is, to be able to get that project done faster. Otherwise, we'd have to go to Congress and get an appropriation and all that. And you can imagine that they can't even agree to increase the debt ceiling on money they already spent let alone, let alone uh, uh, get, get more money for the Houston Ship Channel. So we're having to do it on our own, which is okay. I'm, I, I love the opportunity and the, and the fact that we have the strength financially to do it. So we need your help when, when we're advocating and we're gonna continue to advocate at Congress and, uh, and everything that you can do to make sure that your, your representatives know that, that Port Houston is really important, the Chip Channel is really important, the jobs and the welfare of our region is, is really welcome. So with that, I'll end and uh, take some uh, questions uh, from uh, the audience if you'd like to do that. I appreciate your time today and thank you for what you do every single day for your teams working uh, in and around the, the Houston Ship Channels. We're really partners and, and, and we really appreciate that. So what do I got here? Uh, questions questions. Oh, are they? Okay, well, that's interesting. Oh, so people aren't gonna raise their hand, huh? Oh, good. Okay, I'm waiting. Thank you. Oh, there. Oh, I see how you do it. Oh, cool. My wife could do that. She'd buy a purse or something in the middle of it. It says in the news. Uh, in the news, we see delays in unloading 65 container ships on the west coast. Do you see this possibility that can happen in Port Houston operations? Uh, I don't think 65 for sure. Right now, we have six that are out there in the Gulf. And the challenge is, is, that, is that the logistical system has just is broken. You know, used to be able to get to pretty much time, you know, okay, we're gonna have a ship on Monday and they're gonna unload it in 30 hours and then we're gonna have a ship on Tuesday or Wednesday and, and the, the services, uh, you know, to make it efficient, the way, the way shipping, uh, shipping works is, is a ship just has a service and it goes from, starts at one and goes to 10 and then Starts at one and goes to ten. It just keeps, you know, floating around and dropping off and picking up, dropping off, picking up. Right now, the system's out of whack, and we'll like we likely will have uh, delays. I don't think that uh, we uh, that 65 is a different animal. And part of the challenge in, on the West Coast is they have labor issues. They have and they have just everything you can do. And, and by the way, I, I have a, my own my personal Camden business. I have 12 percent of my properties on the West Coast. And out of the total of Camden, and they're, it is the most difficult place to, to work in America. Uh, just everything you can imagine that, that the, the state or the, their state government puts in front of you is a problem. It's a, and you, we have to have a totally set of diff, different set of, of employee manuals. We have to have a total different work schedule and how we deal with people. It's because California is just different and, they're, and it's just hard to get things through. And so, so I think that the challenge they're having 
has to do with just California's grind, if you will, how hard it is to get things done. Because here, if we have a problem, we'll figure it out, right? And we can get it done, whereas they, even if they have a problem there, they have a tougher uh, way to get that. It's just very tough. So uh, I don't think we'll have 65, but we'll have some. Uh, because we export more to use with products from the chemical industry than most U.S. ports, does that put us at an advantage? Uh, I think it does for sure. Uh, and clearly the, the advantage of, of uh, having these products go out uh, and, and, and having, having a good import-export balance definitely gives Houston an advantage. The other thing that gives us an advantage is, is that we have the ability to expand and contract if we need to, right? And so that gives us, I think, a great advantage. And, and, and we should be able to capture more business from other ports because of that advantage. Uh, how do you see the port's role in energy transition over the next decade? Uh, I think that we have to be part of the solution. So I think we have to join the groups, uh, talk about carbon capture. We have to be a leader in, in our own business, showing uh, private companies what we can do so they can do it as well. And I, and I will tell you that, that uh, it, it is a real thing, this, this whole uh, transition and climate issue. Uh, I'll, I'll use Camden as an example. I had a, a, a meeting maybe seven or eight months ago with one of our large shareholders who owns like half a billion dollars of Camden stock. And he goes, he, he starts out and he says, well, you know what, I, I hate to have, have to have this conversation with you, but uh, my investors tell me that if you don't get better on your e-score, on your ESG, environmental, social, and governance, then they won't, they won't give me money to invest in you. You better get that, you know, you better be more leading and more forward thinking in that area than you are right now, or we're gonna cut your money off. That's a real estate company, not an oil and gas company. So if I'm getting pressure, can you imagine the pre I, I know the pressure that the energy industry is getting. And the bottom line is we have to lead, we cannot follow. And uh, we've been following, and I was following too at Camden, and now I'm starting to lead. And so Port, the port can lead by being an example, 100% renewable electricity, you know, investing in, in, in uh, electric, uh, uh, you know, wherever we can electrify our, our uh, old uh, school stuff, we will. And so, yeah, I mean, I think we have to be part of the equation. Uh, does Port of Houston community have enough chassis to support the increase in TUs in 2021? No, we don't. We have a chassis shortage big time. They're sitting at Costco, Amazon, Walmart, all over, all over the uh, region, and the uh, chassis problem is not gonna be solved very soon. You got 40 seconds left? One more? Uh, I don't see another question here. Okay, good, we're done, thank you. Appreciate it.